Y'all open up to Acts 4.23. We'll resume our study where we left off. And while y'all are turning there, I just want to run down a list of folks we need to continue to pray for. Um, y'all please, please pray for Stan, Theo, and their daughters up in... Uh, close to Birmingham. Um, Y'all keep Lonnie in your prayers. Lonnie's had an opportunity to teach a class on Tuesday night. He had two weeks going now, so keep Lonnie in that class in your prayers. Um, Tim and Brittany, keep keeping y'all's prayers, serving in the church up in Indiana. Keep Lee and Angel in your prayers, that God will open a door for them up, uh, back into the prison ministry. Um, also, keep the Montgomery group in your prayers, and the Raceland group. Uh, Linda Schroeder, I've got a, a message from Linda. She's moved into uh, Arizona. Is it New Mexico or Arizona? Like? Arizona, yeah, and um, she's doing a little better, but they had her moved there for the drier air, for the, her health and whatnot. And then um, y'all please keep Steve and Kathy in your prayers. Um, Steve and Kathy have a big load on them, and thank God that they're uh, putting their shoulder to it, okay? All right, let's go to Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for the privilege again of being able to come out and to worship you. Lord, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for the way that you deal with us in love and mercy, not in wrath. Lord, we know that it's the death of our Savior that made this possible. And like the song says, Lord, when we think of that, we think how great thou art. This morning we want to worship you and we want to adore you in honesty and sincerity. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> okay. In Acts 2, we're going to read from 23 to the end of the chapter, and then we'll come back and talk about it. But y'all remember where we left off. Peter and John had refused to quit preaching, and so they threw them in jail. And they threatened uh, to beat them and everything else. Verse 23 says, Being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, Thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of Thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against His Christ. For of a truth against Thy holy child Jesus, whom Thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither said any of them that all of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things to that were sold, and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. Now I'm going to stop there because Lord willing I want to include Barnabas with, with next week's uh, Ananias and Sapphira. Okay? Alright, now let's just go back. They've been locked up and they're let go. And what I'd like to bring out first off today to keep in our mind is what a difference there is in these men. I mean, it's profound, isn't it? Not only in these men, but as the whole church, as a whole, they're just completely changed, aren't they? I mean, y'all go back and think about the church on the day Jesus Christ died and the three days after. They all but gave up hope, didn't they? And now here they are, and they're out, and they're, they're preaching uh, just completely different. Everything has changed. And look at how they're talking now. They're no longer saying, woe is us. We thought he had been the one. Now they're saying, the Lord, you did exactly what you said you were going to do. Y'all see the difference in them? Now they understand why Christ died, don't they? And you know, until we understand that in our lives, we're never going to get anywhere with the Lord. And it, it, you think about how it, God reveals this to us, and think about the moment when you truly understood, and your eyes were truly open, and you saw that Christ didn't just die, that Christ gave His life by the command of the Father for my sins, that my sins were paid for, 
and that's the moment in my life that everything started to change. Literally everything started to, to open up and go the other way. But for years I might have heard it preached. I don't know. I never heard it with understanding, but I know one thing. When I finally did hear it, for me it was Colossians 2.13. But when he finally opened my eyes, I got it. And that's how the Lord works. I didn't apprehend it. The Lord gave it to me, and He gives it to each and every one of us if we're saved. And He's given it to the church here, hadn't He? Y'all remember in Luke 24 what we read over and over? He opened their eyes, the two on the road to Emmaus. If you come down to the others, it said He opened their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. What was the opening of their understanding centered on? He said, don't you realize the Old Testament said I had to suffer and die and be resurrected? And he told the two on the road to Mass, why are you slow to believe all that the prophets have said? You see, the church has gone from, being think, from thinking God sent his Christ and the world did horrible things to him and we missed out to thinking God has done exactly what he said he was going to do from the foundation of the world. And that's a big difference in a person's life, isn't it? And so now they, they, they're believers. They understand the need for the Lord's death. They begin to understand God's sovereign plan, don't they? They begin to see that Jesus Christ wasn't killed. Jesus Christ was the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. In other words, they quit thinking, look what the Jews did to him. And they say, look what God did for us. And it's a big difference with a person. And another thing they begin to do, as soon as we, we read this, what did they immediately do when they started to pray? They quoted scripture. You see, their eyes have been opened up to, to the meaning of the scriptures, hadn't they? Think what basically happened, right? Um, they, they go out and they preach, and here come the priests, and they're against them, and they beat them up, and they threaten them, and they throw Peter and them in jail. Instead of saying, woe is me, and uh-oh, or denying Christ, when Peter and John come back and tell them what's happened, what do they say? Hey, this is what the scripture said was going to happen. The scripture is being fulfilled. Y'all see how they were taking joy and suffering? We've been going through this on Wednesday night, and look, nobody but a Christian can take joy in Christian suffering. What are they basically saying? God said this was going to happen. Just what happened to Christ, now it's happening to us. And we'll get into it later, but really this is a correct understanding of Old Testament prophecy. It had its fulfillment when we look at it typically in David. David was God's anointed, wasn't he? Samuel poured oil on his head. But what did that oil represent? The Holy Spirit. Then when did that find the, its fulfillment in the real David? In Christ, when the Holy Spirit was poured on him, his anointed, right? But what was happening to Christ the head that had fulfilled that prophecy, now it's happening to his body, isn't it? See, don't, don't always say when a prophecy is fulfilled, we tend to think, check that one off the list. That's not how prophecy generally is fulfilled. It means then it began to happen as it was said. And you know what? It's still happening today. Aren't the world's leaders still gathered together against Christ and His anointed? Who are Christ's anointed on, on the earth today? The church. Y'all look at the laws in our country. Right now, all the laws are being steered and bent and all, and what are they really focused on? It's persecution of Christianity. They don't know why. They think that we're, we hate and we're against this group and that group. Not real Christianity's not. You know, there's a huge controversy raging right now in, uh, amongst real good preaching and good believers because uh, one preacher, Alistair Begg, had made a comment about gay marriage. And I, I didn't hear the whole thing, and I don't know if he was taken out of context, and I don't know what... But don't judge a man based on one statement. A man has served the Lord wonderfully all his life, and now he's made this one statement. Now, do I agree with what he said? No, I don't agree with it, but I don't know the context that he said it in. Y'all know you got you to know what somebody he's talking about. But I did hear another preacher that I like say this. He said, look, don't judge a man by his lowest moment. He said, if he meant that, I disagree with it, but I'm not going to write him off and throw him out. We don't do that, do we? What do we say? We say, now I'm going to have to disagree with you on this, and here's why. But what, what happens with these men is they begin to look at the Scriptures in a whole new light, don't they? And what's the new light they see in the Scriptures? Christ. It's Christ everywhere, isn't it? And so this is their attitude, okay? And again, this is the same experience of every Christian that we go through. And it's reflected in everything that they do here, okay? Let's just look at what they do when the persecution arises. Let's start in verse 23. And being let go, Peter and John. Now, if you had been beaten and threatened, 
and thrown in jail and then let go. What would the average person do? I would read let and let go being packed their bags. They got out of town, right? Not this group. They went to their own company. Where'd they want to be? They wanted to be with believers, didn't they? Don't we know something about this? You know, there are times it, you get out in the world, especially, I am so blessed of God that every day of the week I am able to meet with believers. Every day of the week. And it's an encouraging thing. But I also know how important class is. How important it is to get there and be in those classes because lots of times that's the only fellowship those folks have. He, Steve and Kathy will talk about how Kathy said, oh, I need Tuesday. She tells us all the time, I need my Tuesdays. What's she mean? She means she needs to be with the saints. Right. Yeah? You, and because there, there's, a, there's a, an added effect of being together. So Peter and John get out of jail and immediately we're in uh, Acts 4.23. Gina. Sabrina, Gina arrived late. Point that out. <laughs> Um, but when they're let go, they immediately go right back to the church, don't they? You know, you get out in the world, and, and you see, and you talk, and you hear. You're invited to a, a party or a get-together or something like that. And when you leave, the first thing I always feel is, boy, I can't wait to be with the believers. Because only the believer understands how you see things. Only the believer sees the world as you see it. And I don't mean you have to avoid those things. We're not told to, to be a monk and avoid those things. We're told to go out and preach the gospel, aren't we? But when you get out and listen to the conversations, when you leave, lots of times you feel like you need a bath, don't you? Well, we do. We need a bathing in God's Word and a bathing in fellowship with the believers. And so we seek that. <clears throat> so the first thing they did is they rushed to be with their own people. Now turn to Hebrews 10. Y'all, when COVID first came out, remember that when they... Very first, Trump come out on the TV and said something to the effect of, there's this virus. Remember how it was? We didn't know anything about it. I didn't understand. I didn't know. I didn't anything about what it was or what it wasn't. And they were making it out like, I mean, it was, I mean, it was more serious than, and I'm not saying it wasn't serious, but they were making it out like, hey, this is life or death. We don't need to meet in groups and all that sort of thing. And so the first thing I did is I considered it and I thought about it. And y'all know, I told people that Sunday, you know what, I guess we better not have class. And boy, that began to bother me. Yeah. We didn't have class and it bothered me. And it bothered me real bad because one scripture kept coming into my mind and I had come to a point where I realized, you know what, you have been disobedient to God. I was out of the will of God in saying that. If you don't want to come to class, that's your choice. But it's not my choice to, to cancel it. And here's the scripture that kept bothering me. He says, verse 24, Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. You mean we're to encourage each other in this? Yes. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. As the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching, and on and on. He said, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves. What's that mean? It means keep meeting. Now, whose command is that? God's. Whose command comes first, God's or Trump's? God's. Then we are obedient to civil orders up until the point where they contradict God's orders. And then what do we do? We, we, we rightfully say, I'm sorry, but I must be uh, civilly disobedient in this. I, I can't obey that, God said. And this is what Peter and them do. They ignore the high priest and the authorities, and they go immediately back with these folks. And in assembling together, what, did they, what do we find? Go back to Acts 4. Let's see what the outcome was. In Acts 4, verse 32, it says, The multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul. What did the, the fellowship do for them? It strengthened them. They grow in grace. It makes them stronger in the Lord. That's one of the reasons we need it. And so whenever you say, well, uh, they could have disobeyed and, and, and not gathered together, but they don't. They obey God's word to the T. They ignore the civil authorities. They go immediately back together. They meet with the believers. And you know essentially what their attitude was? 
Well, if, if we're going to be killed, that's God's plan. We've been earmarked to be martyrs. We'll be martyrs. But either way, God's in charge. Isn't there a lot of comfort in knowing that God is in charge? Hey, I find that this is one of the things that gives me comfort in today's society, and sometimes probably too much, because sometimes I'm not as a... What's the word? I'm not, I don't see things as, as desperate as they are for lost people because I tend to think, you know, God's in control. But when I see everything just heading downhill, like, a, a, you know what I know? It wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't God's plan. I mean, this is God's plan. God has deemed all these things to take place, including what? Including the death of His Son. Now, for the church in Jerusalem that day, that seemed like the end of all things, didn't it? But now after the, the cross, they realize, wait a minute, this was God's plan, don't they? And when you begin to think of God as being sovereign, then you begin to have comfort. As long as you don't think God is sovereign, then, sovereign, then you think that man can uh, fight against and overcome the work of God, and then you're in a, a precarious situation, aren't you? You feel like, well, they might get me, they might not know. The thing to remember is not one hair of your head can perish, the Lord said. Now, that don't mean we won't die. Everybody's going to die. It also don't mean you couldn't be killed in His service. It means perish means to, to suffer the second death. Who can hurt a Christian? Nobody. Because to kill a Christian means what? To send them home with reward. So, you know, these men are unaffected by all of this. So they're of one heart and one soul. So here we've got the church, the early church, and it's in unity. Now when it says they're of one heart and one soul, what it basically means is they had one motive and, and one basic intent. What's motivating them? The love of Christ. What's their intention? Spread the gospel. Now that's the church's purpose, first and foremost, isn't it? it that comes before any, uh, anything else, before helping the poor, which we're commanded, but before any of that comes that, loyalty to Christ and His gospel, right? <clears throat> now, go back to John 17. John 17, 20. You know, let's back up to um, 14. This is the real and true Lord's Prayer. This is the Lord Jesus Christ's prayer the night before He's crucified. And He's praying to His Father in verse 14. He says, I have given them Thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. In other words, they're going to treat you the way they treated me. Verse 15, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. Isn't it interesting that the most popular theology today says that God has deemed that before His church can suffer anything, He's going to snatch them out of the world? When right here He says, I pray not that thou takest them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil, and it's evil one. In other words, keep them from, from the snares of the devil. Verse 16, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Sanctify, build them up and cleanse them, set them apart. And what is he going to do that by? Truth. Thy word is true. We need to be washed in the water of the word constantly, don't we? Well, what did we find them doing that day that they met together? They assessed the situation and they said, we're being persecuted. And boom, what did the Holy Spirit bring to their mind? Psalm 2. And they said, oh yeah, the word said this. This is what we should expect. What did that make them? Stronger. They were sanctified. Now watch, he says... 18, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world, and for their sakes I sanctify myself. He's talking about setting himself apart for death here in just a few hours. He said that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. There me and you are, aren't we? How did we come to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Through their word. They preached it and wrote it down, and other men that they preached it to, uh, some of them took notes and wrote, but from that point forward, it's been passed right on down to generations, hadn't it? He says, verse 21, 
He's praying that they all may be one, as thou, Father, are in me, and I in thee, that they may also be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Are they all one here in the book of Acts? Yeah. One heart and one soul. And why did he say that was? Just for their benefit? No, that the world might see it. Y'all know the world is going to see more gospel than it'll ever listen to. How, what do I mean by that? They're going to see the Christians and how they, you know what you find in the, if you read some of the letters in the old Antonicene fathers and uh, what some of the old writers said and all, what the unbelievers kept saying about the church, they were stunned at how they loved each other. They would give up their life for each other. They took care of each other. And that's the thing they kept saying, oh, how they love each other. Y'all think in the Roman world what life was like. No, it was brutal. I mean, you go up, I've said it before, you go up and there's one loaf of bread left. And what happened? Well, it'll pull out the sword and fight. And what does the Christian do? Yeah, you can have it. You see, it was a testimony to them. He, look, I'm, the Roman world was like Walmart on Black Friday. It was dog eat dog, right? Now he says, verse 22, The glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect or complete in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. That's exactly what we see in the book of Acts, isn't it? Go back over to Acts 4. <clears throat> in Acts 4 again, it says in verse uh, 32... And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. People see this. People know it. Now, the great power doesn't necessarily mean refer to the miracles. That's going to come in a minute. It meant their preaching had an effect, didn't it? Look, many men down through history, you can say that. They preached and God added great power to the preaching. George Whitfield would preach and hundreds and thousands of people would be brought to tears and converted. Well, George Whitfield didn't do it. The Spirit of God did it. And here he is, the Spirit of God's working in the early church. Okay, so the first thing we had then is they rushed to be with their own people. But the second thing is they put, they made prayer a priority. Okay, go back to chapter 4 again, verse 23. All right, watch what they do. Being let go, Peter and John from prison, they went to their own company, and they reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. They come back and they give like a missions report, don't they? Hey, y'all know I just got it in the mail uh, a couple days ago from Greg Johnson, the Central Asia product, Project. Sends out a newsletter and tells you what's going on. I found he's on Facebook, too, and he puts stuff on there. I like that. I like to know what's going on. And I like to see him. I, he, one picture, he put a video up, and they were laughing. They're driving in a van trying to go teach a class somewhere. And I'm talking about it is blinding snow. I mean, just blinding snow. And there he is, him and a couple of those fellas out heading to preach the gospel. I want to see that, don't y'all? You know, I'll tell y'all that it, we have been uh, blessed this year that we've been able to increase the amount we're able to give them every month. I thank God for that. Hey, I thank God for every person over there that's preaching the gospel, for every believer, and for anybody that helps them. That's what the church is commanded to do. And so when I get those newsletters, I like them. He's letting us know what's going on, and he tells you, you know, I want to know that stuff, don't y'all? When they come back, lots of times in the old days, they, churches would have what they call mission report night. And they'd get together and the, mission, the missionaries they sent out would come and they'd give them a detail. They'd say, hey, we got this going on and all. Well, we need those things. So they tell them what's going on. And verse 24 says, when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord. Now that doesn't mean they all prayed in repetition the same prayer. It means they all had the same heart, the same intention, and they begin to pray. This is what we call an old-fashioned prayer meeting, isn't it? You know, it's a shame that uh, we don't have these the way they used to. In old fashioned, they'd get together and sometimes for hours they'd just pray. Now, I suspect that the leaders are praying, but the people are all involved too. So let's just talk about this, this prayer. You know, I did this before with y'all, but Acts. This is old. This is nothing I've invented. 
Okay. Long ago, people came up with this. <clears throat> it's a, um, what do you call it when you, in a, is it an acronym? Acronym, okay. It is adoration, okay, prayer, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. Y'all know if you look at those in that order and you think about it, that's basically the model prayer, the Lord's Prayer, isn't it? It's not that we have to repeat those words, although you can if you're sincere and not just doing it in a, you know, thing, you can. But that's the, the form that our prayers ought to take. What comes first? God, His glory. And so the first thing we do, look, we just sung um, How Great Thou Art. I love that hymn because it follows this. Y'all think about it. How does that hymn start? I looked up in the heavens and I thought, wow, who did all of this? And then I look at the birds and the creatures down here and I think, wow, who did all of this? And the next thing I know, I see the cross and I think, whoa, he did that. And what does his heart cry out? How great thou art. And where does it end? It ends with him going back to heaven, doesn't it? And great hymns will do that a lot of times. But to start with the adoration of God, for instance, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. God's glory comes first, doesn't it? And so we don't just bum rush God's throne with our needs. Our needs come last. I mean, y'all think about the Lord's Prayer. When do you get around to our needs? Down after you get through the other stuff, you get to give us this day our daily bread. Lead us not into temptation, don't you? So watch how they do it. <clears throat> he says in verse 24, when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, Thou art God. Now when the, this early church said, Lord, who are they talking to? Jesus Christ. Yeah. Who is our Lord? Jesus Christ. Thou art God. In other words, you did this. You are the Son of God that God has commanded to do all these things. You are, thou art God which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that, is in, all that in them is. Think what they're saying. Okay, Lord, certain things have begun to happen here, but you know what? You own it all. You created all things and you are in charge. They're, they're recognizing God's sovereignty. Ne next, they immediately go to the Word of God, they say who by the mouth of thy servant David has said. So prayer ought to be according to Scripture, shouldn't it? Have y'all not noticed how when you pray sincerely, how many times Scripture comes on your mind? He, you know, John Calvin said, prayer is simply suing God for His promises. I know we don't use the word sue like that anymore. We look, talk about courts, but when you sue someone, what you're doing is you're trying to acquire what's yours, what, what ought to be given to you. If God has made the promise in His Word to us, we can go to God in prayer, can't we? Ask for it. He's wanting to give it to us. Okay, so let, let's deal first with the adoration and God's sovereignty. He, he recognizes God as creator, and then immediately says, David said. So under adoration, he says, okay, God, you're our creator. Now, what does that imply? You control everything, right? But you're also the revelator. And by revelator, I mean who reveals himself, who reveals the truth, who reveals his will to us. That's why he said, you created all things and you revealed to us through David that here's what's going to happen. The kings are going to set themselves against you. We'll get to Psalm 2 in a minute, but what Psalm 2 basically says is the leaders of this world would like nothing better than if they could just throw God out, to, ha to have God not rule over them, to have nothing to do with God. If they could just be rid of the idea of God altogether, that's what they would like. Now, did the rulers in, in Jesus Christ's day do it? Yeah. Herod joined with Pontius Pilate, and they joined with, with the Jewish leaders, and what did they do? They said, we'll not have this man rule over us, and they got rid of him, didn't they? Well, are they going to want to treat his church any better? No, not at all. All right, um, this is the same thing that he said, by the way. Look in verse uh, 28. They say... Um, this is a quote from Psalms. What these rulers did, verse 28 they say, for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. Y'all see what they're saying? 
They're saying, hey, the heathen rulers and their people and the unbelievers are raging against the Christ and His church, but that was God's plan all along. Nothing should surprise us in this, should it? I tell you, when a Christian ought to be surprised is when everybody treats him great. If everybody treats you great, especially the lost world, if the lost world loves you, we need to examine ourselves because there's something wrong probably. Okay. <clears throat> um, now, another thing that, that they do here is they also, it really, they're repeating the words of Peter. If you go back to chapter 2, remember Peter said this earlier on. Now, if I put us a timeline up here, the Jews were looking, they said, all their life for the coming Messiah, right? And when the Messiah came, what did they do for the most part? They rejected Him. What was the thing that caused them to reject Jesus Christ above everything else after the cross? The cross. Hey, He died. How can that be the Messiah He died? How could the King that God promised would rule forever die like a criminal on a cross? And so as they go out and they're preaching to the unbelieving Jews, what's the point they're wanting to drive home? That's what was always supposed to happen. You, you, you are looking for the Messiah to come and do something He never came to do. He came to do exactly what God had planned before the foundation of the world. So their preaching is to show them, open your eyes and think about the Scriptures. The Scriptures say in Psalm 2, which they all knew, it's one of their famous Psalms, the Scriptures all say that when the Lord's anointed comes, how are the people going to treat Him? They're going to hate Him. They're going to rise up against Him. The, the people were all saying, well, if it, we didn't accept Him and we crucified Him, and the fact that He was crucified proves He's not the Messiah, and Peter and John are saying, no, it proves that He exactly is who He you know, who claimed to be. So in 2.22, uh, Peter says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by wicked hands, have crucified and slain. Then what was he saying Calvary was? God's plan. And so what they're basically telling the unbelieving Jews is, this was God's purpose all along. And rather than using this as the main proof that Jesus couldn't be the Messiah, if you'll look at the Old Testament with fresh eyes and look at it clearly for God's suffering servants back there all over, you'll realize that far, being, that far from being that this makes it impossible for Him to be the Messiah, this is the proof that He's the Messiah. And that's how they're preaching to Him. And they continue to do this over and over. Um, all right, go to 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter writes the same thing later in his first epistle. While y'all turn in there, I've got a quote I want to read you. I like this one. Predestination is a doctrine to be believed and trusted, to comfort us. It's not a doctrine to be fully understood. Isn't that good? That's the truth. You have never met anyone that understands God's sovereign election. It's the greatest minds that have ever lived have studied on it. Look, probably the, the I mean, the greatest theologian America has ever produced, without any doubt, is Jonathan Edwards. And Jonathan Edwards wrote a lot on election. And in the end, what did he say? Most of it's still just beyond our grasp. Why does it surprise us that we can't understand the things in the mind of God? We shouldn't. we shouldn't. I mean, think how arrogant it is to say, well, if I can't understand it, it must not be true. It's just silly, isn't it? But it goes against what we consider to be fair. Like, no, who cares what we think? What we think doesn't matter. What matters is that this was God's plan. You know, the, the absolute proof beyond anything else that the cross was God's plan? Because if it wasn't, it wouldn't have happened. Period. I mean, wouldn't you say? Amen. Can we all agree with that? Well, then couldn't we also agree with this, that if God wanted to choose Israel as His nation, He chose Israel. You say, well, why didn't He choose the Amorites or the Hittites or the Jebusites? I don't know. I don't need to know. God chose Israel. Why was Israel God's chosen people? 
Because that's who God chose. I don't know why. That's just who He chose, right? If He chose another nation, we'd be saying the same thing. We'd be saying the same thing. Now, all of a sudden, here's where the rub comes in. What would make us think that an eternal, sovereign God doesn't know exactly who He's going to save? But somehow that bothers us because we tend to think that we're sovereign. It's because of sin. Sin is the rebellion where we want our will, not God's. And man does not like the fact that God chooses who he's going to save. And so we want to believe that we play a part in it. But we don't fight over any of the other electing purposes of God until it comes down to that. Why? Because of sin. Okay, so uh, in, in the first Peter, watch how Peter does this in verse uh, 18, chapter 1. He says, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, redeemed, bought out from slavery, corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. In other words, we received something from our fathers that basically we're all in bondage to. Well, what does it ultimately amount to? Sin and the ways of man. Man's traditions, well, you can't be saved by any man-made religion. It's all a system of works, no matter what it is. So he says next, but we have been redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in these last times for you. Now, what do we call in the Bible, what's the last times? It's what many people would call the church age. It's the time after Messiah sets up his kingdom. And when did God make manifest this purpose? After he did it. And what's Peter, James, and John doing? They're going out and they're making it known. And when did it become clear to them? After it took place. And so what they're basically trying to tell the Jews, the Jewish people, they understand perfectly themselves. They're trying to tell them you are misunderstanding the purposes of God. God's purpose is not a political purpose. It's not even an earthly purpose. God's purpose is eternal and spiritual. And the Jews were limited to a little small section of space and time, weren't they? And so after the cross, as Christ began to reveal these things to him, again, what's his message every time? Why are you surprised that I died? That's what he keeps telling them. Why are you surprised that any of this happened? Why did it happen? Because this was God's purpose from before the foundation of the world. And when you and I begin to see that, all of a sudden things begin to, to get in their proper perspective, don't they? He, he, he explained it to him, Matthew 16 that he was going to die, you know. But yet, it had to be hidden from It was hidden, that's right. That they right. couldn't understand it. They couldn't. Matter of fact, Luke says they could not believe it. They couldn't. What's that tell you? It tells me in God's electing purposes, I'm not going to believe until God opens my eyes. So what's got to happen first, my believing or God's opening my eyes? Well, how am I going to say salvation started with me and my will? Y'all see how foolish that is? Look, the, the surest proof, election itself is the surest proof of God's revelation because God hadn't shown any man completely what that's about. And so what's happened? No man's ever figured it out. No man will. When he chose us, it was in holiness. He better believe it. He chose us in holiness and perfection and righteousness and in a mind that is straight. Right. Any, uh, any concoction mean you could come up with is going to be perverted. Right. I'll tell you the one that people generally jump to first is God looked out through time and saw everybody that would believe. The scripture doesn't say that. The scripture says a lost man can't believe. It's impossible. A dead man can do nothing. What's got to happen first? God's got to make them alive. If you think anything in the scriptures other than sin starts with us, you're wrong. It's the work of God. This is the scriptures aren't about me and you. It's about God reclaiming his people from me and you. Okay. <clears throat> now, um, the second thing is uh, in this, God's word in their prayer. They immediately start quoting Psalm 2, don't they? Y'all see how they're thinking now? Now they see something taking place and their worldview has changed. What's the first thing they do when they see events taking place? In their mind, they say, okay, let's run this through the Scriptures. Let's filter it through the Scriptures. Do the Scriptures say this ought to be happening? And what do they say? Well, yeah, this is what the Scripture said would happen. Go to Psalm 2. This is one of the most oft-quoted psalms in the New Testament. 
You know, we're going to just read the whole psalm, but I want you all to think about this. In your mind while we're reading this, compare this to the doctrine that says that Christ offered the kingdom and it failed, and Christ will once again produce the kingdom over here. You, you listen to this psalm and tell me how in the world that can be. Okay? Psalm 2.1. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Now remember, David wrote this. And in a type, it's going to apply to David. David was running for his life, wasn't he? And he wasn't just running from Saul and, and the Jews. He was running from the heathen too. He was cast amongst the nation. So here he is. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed. Now that word anointed is our word for Christ. David was God's anointed, but he was only a type of the real anointed. He says, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Y'all look at the plurality there. How did the Jew pray the heathen thought about God? In a plural. The Lord and His anointed. Now we know there's the Holy Spirit too. But they say, let us break their cords asunder. Who would the world like to break asunder from today? God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh. You know, that's the only scripture I know of that talks about God laughing. I heard a man teach the other day. He said, you never once hear God laugh in scripture. And I thought, no, wait, there's that one right here. He will laugh. What's that tell you? The foolishness. the foolishness of it. Is man doing something that God's not aware of? No. They're only doing it because God allowed it. Yes. Y'all know it's a lot like raising a little kid. I mean, really, I'm learning more about God with a three-year-old than I ever dreamed I would. He, I spent, Lexi's trading with some old lady in Montgomery on sewing stuff. Well, you know, my granny used to talk like that. Well, I trade over here, remember? <laughs> but so I drove her to uh, almost to Montgomery yesterday, and I spent six straight hours in the car with Gabriel. Three hours there and three hours back, right? <laughs> listening to his conversation, watching what he's doing and all. I like to watch and I watch in the rear view mirror and his eyes and his thoughts. You, you can predict what he's doing. You begin, Courtney, you do this. Do you begin to look and know his motives and know what's coming? You understand what's behind what's causing him to do it, don't you? Do you think God don't know that about man? What's behind man wanting to cast God away? Rebellion. We want to be in charge, don't we? He t I heard him tell uh, Lexi a couple of weeks ago, you don't tell me what to do. And before I could come up and get out of that chair, she was on him. <laughs> hey, but the point being is, ain't that how we all think? I remember thinking that. I just wasn't brave enough to say it. <laughs> I admire his bravery, but the whole point being is we want to cast off all authority figures. And who's the ultimate authority figure? God. Y'all know what the, the world's really, uh, truly the world's greatest problem today in this regard is they can't snuff out the church. No matter how hard Satan tries, he can't snuff it out. Now, the worldly church, and God has allowed this. Look, if you look at Israel in the Old Testament, they're a type. And Israel in the Old Testament was a large professing body of people. But not many of them really wanted to serve God. And because that professing body became so dirty and filthy, what did God do? He cast the whole bunch of them into the fire. He took care of His remnant and cooked out the impurities. Well, what's going on with the church in our country right now? It's the same thing. Folks, look at it. It's roaring the stuff you see. Y'all realize that more and more every day there's preaching out there that they're talking about homosexual preachers. And well, folks, I don't hate homosexuals, but you cannot say that God didn't ordain that that's sin. It is sin. It'd be no different than if you had a murderous preacher. Who would say it's okay for preachers to be murderers? It's not. Can a preacher commit murder? Yeah. I've committed it in my heart yesterday on the interstate. But the point being, I don't mean I want to murder Gabriel, by the way. <laughs> but the, the point being is you can't snub your nose at God and then claim that you're living it in obedience to God and a desire to... Look, the slave master does not tell the slave, I'll do everything that you said except number 9 and 10. That's not how it works. No, if you tell the slave master, slave tells the slave master, I'll be obedient up until a point. You know what's going to happen? He's going to get a beating, isn't he? And so we got to see that what's going on in the church, even the, the church today, it's God's will. 
Folks, we have gone the way of the world, just like God did with Israel. Because Israel set their heart on the things of the world, including their gods, what did God do? He sent them out into the world. What's the, what, what one city in the Scripture is, is more symbolic of the world than any other? Babylon. Well, Corinth, the church, yeah. I was thinking of uh, chapter 5 of Corinth. Yeah, but you're reading about it, aren't you? Babylon. So where did God send His people to captivity? Babylon. And what happened to them down there? He cleansed them out and brought a remnant home, didn't He? What has happened to the church today? God's let them go off into Babylon, the world. Hey, we brought the world into the church. People say all the time we're supposed to be, be, be taking the church to the world. Mm -hmm. he, while we were singing earlier, uh, when Lexi turned that machine on at first, it's got them lights on it. And my first thought is, I wonder if this makes us one of these new age churches now. We got our, you know what I mean? <laughs> our strobe lights and light show. But that's the, it's going the way of the world, didn't it? Israel did it. The world always has its uh, effect against the church, not by persecuting, but by infiltrating. Okay? All right, now, Psalm 2, verse uh, 4. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. You know, if you've got somebody in derision, what that means? You got them right where you want them. Y'all know, in, in my thinking on this verse, every time I come to the same picture, Saul of Tarsus. Boy, he's riding along, isn't he? Fighting against the Lord. And a couple seconds later, where's he at? In my mind, I picture Christ with his foot on his throat. There he is laying in the dirt. He's got his foot on his throat. And he says, now, how do you like to kick against the pricks, the ox goad? It hurts when you kick against it, doesn't it? Did God have him in derision? He was doing exactly what God had planned. He said, then shall he speak unto them in his wrath. God's going to have them right where He wants them, and then what? Then comes the wrath. He vexed them in His sore displeasure. Yet, at the same time, He says, I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Who's that? Christ. When did Christ set on Zion? When He ascended up. And so what we're reading about here is, is a period of time where the church is in the world during this period, Right? Not some future prosperity, no, right now. Verse 7 says, I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. You know both Peter and Paul quote that, and Paul says that's not referring to Jesus' physical birth. It's referring to His resurrection. He says, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. When did Christ start going to the uttermost parts of the earth? After the cross, through His gospel. He says, Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now therefore, O you kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. In other words, he's saying, look, this is what he's doing, and you're either going to get in with it or you're going to be on the other side. You're on one team or the other. Now, one of the greatest verses in Scripture, 12, kiss the son lest he be angry, and you perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Over here... No, here's the period of time when you've got to trust Him. If you haven't trusted Him when He comes, it's too late, isn't it? So this is what He's quoting. Now look what the believers did. Persecution comes their way. Did they cry, woe is me? Did they pray out, Lord, stop the persecution? Did they say, oh, why, why? No, what did they say instead? This is what God said. They take everything that's going on and they run it through the filter in their mind of the Scripture and they say, oh, wait a minute, that's right. The Holy Spirit is doing what God promised. Christ said He will call to your remembrance the things which I have said. And so what did they come out of saying? Well, this is God's plan and amen, let's get on with it. Instead of packing their bags and running, they say, well, if God planned this, God's got a purpose and whatever it is, it's got to be right. It's God's. If we're meant to die, we're going to die. And if we're not meant to die, we're not going to die. So we'll be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
They said, if it's God's will we die, we die. If it's God's will that we live, we'll live. Either way, we're not going to obey you, Nebuchadnezzar. And they went into the fire, didn't they? And what happened to them? They come out the fire free of the, of the world's containment. Remember the ropes the world put on them? When they come out the other side, they were gone, weren't they? Yeah, so that's the whole picture there. All right, let's take a break, and then we'll pick it up and, and carry on some more. <clears throat> Yeah, it's got a warm heart. <laughs> <laughs> 